Uh, John, turn to John chapter 3. And when you get there, we'll pray. Um, the good news is we don't pray for Sister Linda Toomey anymore. The good news is her faith has become sight. She no longer has hope. She no longer has faith because she no longer needs it. So charity endureth forever. So pray for her family, though. Pray for each and every one. And uh, pray for God's word tonight. John chapter 3. There was a man in the, in the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, I want you to think about that. This actually, John 3, what Jesus just said here is basically, as the Eucharist is the foundation of the Catholic Church, John 3, the teaching that Jesus gave, both in John 3.3 3 and John 3.16, are pretty much the foundations of what makes Christianity Christianity. Okay, and I'll show you why I have these numbers 10 up on the screen here in a little bit. Let's go to prayer. Father, we ask God that you bless the word tonight. Bless all of those, Lord, who are attending with us wherever they be. We thank you, Lord God, for using uh, them and their faithfulness to your word and to study your word, your word tonight to be attentive with us online. For those that are here, we thank you, Lord, for them. And we pray, Heavenly Father, God, for all of our Catholic friends. And, Father, I want to be friends with Catholics and not their enemies because I want them to know the truth. I want them to listen to what your word, not what I said, but what your word says. I want them to hear the message, Father, that, uh, Lord, I've struggled. I've struggled now for a week and a half with putting this together. And still not ready yet. I pray, dear God, that you would help me, help me put it together, and help me to, Father, when I record it, to have a spirit of love, because there are many Roman Catholics in Turkana, some in Samburu. The Roman Catholic Church has churches in Nairobi, all throughout Kenya, America, Australia, England. Philippines, places in India where people are hearing what we're saying. And Father, I know the probably the priest and the nuns are not going to like it. But Father, I'd like to just open the eyes of somebody who is a Roman Catholic and get them to realize that they are in one of the largest, in fact, if the largest cult in the entire world. And that they're not saved by monks and nuns and angels have no part in their salvation. And that idol that they bow to, Father, it has no part in their salvation whatsoever. In fact, you told us not to do that. So, Father, I'd like to reach out to them. And I pray, dear God, that you would humble me and use me, dear God, to save somebody. So, Father, I pray, dear God, that you would just bless the word both tonight and that which I'm preparing. Pray to God that you would, we, we thank you for Nicodemus, a man who obviously loved you and believed you and trusted you and you opened up for him the literal kingdom of God and how to be part of it. And I thank you, dear God, Lord, I believe we'll see him in heaven. I pray, dear God, that you would bless this story tonight. And bless John chapter 3. Bless the word that goes into our hearts tonight. We pray in Jesus' name and all the God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now, I have these numbers, 10, 100, 1,000 up on the screen uh, because they mean something in relation to uh, what I'm going to teach you tonight. The number 10 is the number for dominion and thrones and a king. So, and things like that. Somebody that rules over somebody. In Genesis 10, 
the, in, from the creation of Adam through the flood. Now we have gone past the flood. Now we have peoples being uh, uh, generated all throughout the earth. And we have the very first mention of a king in Genesis chapter 10. And by the way, we have the first mention of a kingdom in Genesis chapter 10. We have the king Nimrod and we have his kingdom, which was Babel, Akkad, Erech, and Shinar, I believe. But he, we have the very first mention of a king and a kingdom in Genesis chapter 10. In Exodus 20, which 20 is a multiple of 10, that's the 70th chapter of the Bible. And that's where you'll find, and God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's the, that's the listing of the ten commandments. And Paul said in, Revela in Romans 7, that what know ye not that the law hath dominion over a man so long as he liveth. And what he was referring to was the ten commandments. Ten commandments has dominion over your physical flesh body as long as that flesh body is in existence. The law has dominion over it. And because of your body has broken these laws, it is doomed and destined to die and not even salvation is going to correct that. Salva in fact, salvation is what causes us to be ready to release this body, let it go and die so that we can have the new body that he's going to give us when he comes into his kingdom. But those 10 commandments are in the 70th chapter of the Bible. In Psalm chapter 90, verse 4, for a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when in his past and as a watch in the night. Well, that, the companion verse to that is in Second Peter. A, thousand, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. So that, when you think of the phrase thousand years, by the way, the exact phrase thousand years. Guess how many times it is, it's not a thousand. Ten times exactly. The phrase thousand years is mentioned exactly ten times in your King James Bible. And a thousand, of course, is ten times ten times ten. So, in Revelation 20, verse 4, I saw thrones and they sat upon them. This, this was a question that was asked of me, I think actually Sunday night, and I answered it yesterday during PMO. And they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of, the, of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned. There it is, reigned. We have thrones and we have people that reign, Christ and us, with Christ a thousand years. The group that does that is mentioned in Enoch's prophecy the Lord becometh with ten thousands of his saints. He uses that number ten and thousands to show that these people, these saints, are going to come and rule over the world. So I explained yesterday that I believe that when Christ comes and sets up his kingdom, he brings us with him to help rule over and judge the entire earth. That's why we are the ten thousands of his saints. So that's what that number means. So the thousand, the number 10, the number 100, the number 1000, the word king with a capital K is mentioned exactly 70 times in the King James Bible. That goes along with like the 70th chapter, the Ten Commandments, because the king is supposed to rule by the dominion of the law. He's supposed to rule by the law. Write him a book of the law and, and rule by it. Okay? So even if we were to divide a thousand and half to 500, if you go to the 500th chapter of the Bible, you're in Psalm 22 and it starts out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then it says, they pierce my hands and feet. And then it says, they part my garments among them and cast lots for my vesture. What is he talking about? He's talking about Calvary and Christ's crucifixion on the Calvary. That's what provides us the way with being part of the kingdom of God is Christ's crucifixion at Calvary. And that's in the 500th chapter of the Bible, Psalm 22. So guess what the 1000th chapter of the Bible is? John 3. And it tells you how you can be in the kingdom of God. Because that's what he wanted to know. 
There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler. The Jews, the same, came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see what? The kingdom of God, which lasts a thousand years, and it just, just happens that you're in the 1,000th chapter of the Bible. Again, that's a fact. If you don't like the fact, don't blame me. Don't be mad at me. I didn't put it there. King James didn't put it there. The translators didn't put it there. God put it there. It's there. It's a fact. It's 1, 000, count them yourself if you want to. 1,000th chapter of the Bible tells us. That, and again, John 3 is the foundation of what Christianity is really all about. It's not about convents and monasteries. And little boys at the altar boys who are destined for trouble. It's not about any of that stuff. It is about being born again. And Nicodemus, a Jew, a wise Jew, he's one of the rulers of Israel, and I believe he's a godly man, but he does not understand being born again. Does not comprehend it. So what does it mean? You must be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. So in verse 4, Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, some people will use this verse to justify water baptism as being necessary for salvation. It's not true. It's not true. If anything, you could look at it multiple ways. Water is the word of God. Water is what held you in the womb for nine months. And you were born that way, of water. But then you must be born of the spirit as well. So, except a man... Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And he says it, he spells it out, what he, what he meant by that. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That's the water birth. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. That's the new birth, the second birth. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth. Thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the spirit. You can't, in other words, you can't see the wind. You can hear it. You can know of it. But you can't actually see a gust of wind coming. And once it hits you, you can't see where that gust of wind is going again, unless it's picking up dust or moving leaves. So when he's talking about the spirit, you can't see the inner man. You don't, you cannot detect, you can't look at somebody and say, I can see that you're a Christian. There's been people on um, Sid Ross at Supernatural who claim, and other people who claim that they can see angels. One gal by the name of Kat Kerr, she's one of these apostolic reformation people. She claims that in every church service she goes to, she can see the angels that are with every people, everybody in the room. She's just making that stuff up. I could make that stuff up if I wanted to. If I wanted to be that stupid... And rich like her, I can make everybody believe I can see the angels that are around you. She can't. She can't see nothing like that. 
So the wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Notice the word. Notice that he he linked the wind with the Spirit. The word Spirit is from the Latin word spiritus, which means breath or wind or air. Just like in Greek, it's pneuma. You can get pneumonia. That's a d disease of the lungs. Pneumatic tools are tools driven by air. So he said, Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel? And knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and you receive not our witness. If I have told you of earthly things, and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things, this goes along with my argument and premise that if you don't believe what the Bible says about the universe, the sun, the stars, the creation, Noah's flood, Moses dividing the Red Sea, if you don't believe those parts of the Bible, how can you be expected to believe any other part of the Bible? Like about your salvation. With God, you either believe the whole package or you don't believe him. It's all or nothing. Now, you know, people have to grow into it, grow in grace, and I understand all that. But my goodness, to reject parts of the Bible as being unscientific or unrealistic or non-historic or archaeology has never discovered such a thing. So what? The Bible's still got to be right when it says it. I believe a whale swallowed Jonah. I believe God prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. For three days he was there. You can ask all kinds of questions about how did he live? How did he breathe? How did he do this? How did he do that? Well, I can't tell you that. What I can tell you is I believe every word of it. God prepared it. God did it. God allowed it. So that's what he's saying here. You can't believe the earthly things. How can you believe the spiritual things, the heavenly things? Verse 13, and no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the son of man, which is in heaven. In other words, no one has gone up to heaven, talked to God and got a bunch of answers from him and found out how everything works and came back down and said, boy, I just had the trip of a lifetime. I went up in a spaceship and I went all the way up into heaven and I talked to God for a while and he explained everything to me. He said, nobody's ever done that before. But I've come down from heaven to tell you what God has sent me to tell you the truth. That's what we believe. We believe that every part of this Bible is given to us by Jesus Christ. And every part of it is either to be believed or every part of it must then be rejected. You cannot pick and choose which parts of the Bible you're going to believe. Turn to 1 Peter. This is the third time. There's only three times in the Bible. And three is the number for resurrection. Think about that. Born again, born again, born again. That's resurrection. Okay? So it's the, this is the third occurrence. Two occurrences are in John chapter 3. Third occurrence is in 1 Peter chapter 1. Being born again. And boy, I mean, I can't wait. I want to get this thing out of me that I've been studying because it's angered me. It's frustrated me. Because the Catholic Church lays your salvation on whether or not you believe that that wafer literally becomes the body of Christ. The flesh. Carpe diem. The flesh of God. You, you have to believe that. Now, to throw, to throw, um, Catholics 
really into it, there has been occurrences where, and I don't know if they were faked or if they were actual satanic lying signs and wonders. But as recently as the last 20 years, there is a Korean woman by the name of Julie Kim who has on at least 33 occasions received the Eucharist as a Catholic and then when she opened her mouth, she had a disc of flesh on her tongue. Yeah. And the one time it was done at the Vatican with her there and they filmed it. Now, I could hide a disc of bologna in my mouth and pretend that that's, that's what it turned into. Look at that. I got Jesus on my tongue. Okay? So I don't know if it's a fake or a real lying sign and wonder. Could be either one. But they're telling you that if you do not believe that that Eucharist becomes the literal flesh of Jesus Christ, you cannot receive the grace of God. You can't. And yet Peter, who they say was the first pope, what did he say? Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Did he mention anything about the wafer becoming the physical body of Jesus? And you see, they tell Catholics this and they have to explain to them the fact that, yes, even though it still tastes and feels like a wheat wafer in your mouth and when you ingest it, it feels and tastes and ingests like a wheat wafer in your mouth. Don't believe that. Believe that it is the real presence of the flesh of Jesus Christ that you have just swallowed. So when a Catholic says, I have received Christ, they do not mean it the same way we mean it. They mean it as I swallowed Jesus. Okay. But what did Jesus say? About the things that enter into the body. Huh? Right. And what does he say eventually happens to it? Cast out into the draft, which is the, the pot, the potty, chamber pot, toilet. And cast out. That's as good as their, their little wafer is. That's what happens to it. And that's something... Boy, it is. It's, it's wicked. And it's defiling. You're born again, not from that flesh that you eat, that blood that you drink. You're born again by the book of God, which liveth and abideth forever. See, in the Catholic Church, you can't just eat the body of Christ one time and be saved forever. You can't, that doesn't work that way. They require a repeat of that very event. They say at least once a year, but you should do it every Sunday. But at least, which is why most Catholics go to church on Easter to get it out of the way, to get their one requirement in, and now they're saved for a whole year. Stupid. Okay. For all flesh is as... What is that? Look at this. Boy, didn't Peter know what he was talking For all flesh is grass and the glory of man as the flower of grass and the grass withereth and the flower thereof falleth away. So does their salvation. No Catholic can ever know for sure whether or not they are going to heaven at any given time. It's impossible for them to know that. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. So according to Peter, who they say was the first pope, which lasts longer? 
The Word of God or the communion wafer? The Word of God. Flesh passes away. But the Word of God never passes away. 1 John 3, 9. These are verses about what happens when you are born again. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth not his wafer flesh disc. And I, I am telling you what else I found too. If a priest opens a box of communion wafers and one of them is chipped, can't be used. It has to be perfectly round like what? Huh? The sun. The sun. It does. It has to be perfectly round. See, we've had communion where we break them up in little squares, right? But they, you never, you have never gone to a Catholic mass and had to pull out a square communion wafer, ever. They're always round in the shape of the sun. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. He cannot sin because he is born of God. Now, what is that talking about? Is that telling us that once you're saved, you will never sin again? And if you happen to sin, it's obvious you're not saved. Is that what it means? No, because it's referring to what was born of God. What was born of God is not this flesh that you see on the outside of Mike Hoggard. That's born of man, not of God. The wind bloweth and you can't see the wind. So the new man, this, the spirit conceived in me a new man. That's the part of me that does not, did not, and cannot sin. Because God doesn't sin. And the new man in me is preserved. In fact, he's renewed daily okay so that's and don't let anybody use that verse to make you think that if you sinned you are not saved and it's impossible for you to be saved because look right there it says anybody that sins you say you're born of god well you sinned obviously you're not born of god they have no idea what they're talking about first john 4 7 beloved let us love one another for love is of god and every one that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. You have to love sinners. I'm asking God to help me love sinners. The political side of Mike Hoggard realizes that it's the wicked, defiled, hell-deserving sinners that's destroying our country. And it makes me politically angry at them and politically incorrect. So I'm asking God, God, let me be a Christian first and an American second. Help me and teach me to love sinners and want to see them saved. That will fix the political problems. It will. 1 John 5, 1, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And every, every one that love, see, the reason why I'm bringing up this Eucharist thing is in Matthew 24, Jesus said, if any man said, lo, here is Christ or there, believe it not. So when they parade through the towns of Europe and they're holding what's called the monstrance, doesn't mean a monster. It means a, like a demonstration. The monstrance is a great big image of sun's rays coming out of the Eucharist. They have a, a Catholic wafer in there that has been consecrated by a priest and turned into the body of Christ. And they parade that through town. And they say to everybody, here's Christ. 
And everybody in town bows before that wafer. And that shows that they believe that that really is Christ because they're told that they must adore and worship the Eucharist. It's called Eucharistic adoration. They must adore and worship the Eucharist as the priest or whoever carries that through town. Everybody must bow before it. But some people, especially in Europe and some third world countries, are catching on. And they're throwing food and they're throwing rocks and stuff at it. And it's caused, this is what I read today, it's caused some of the churches to stop having public demonstrations of the Eucharist. Now they just do it in the churches where it's safe. Good for them. Um, Whosoever believeth that Jesus Christ is born of God and everyone that loveth him that begat Love them also that is begotten of him. First John 5, 4, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. Amen. You're going to win. You're going to win. But not your flesh, your spirit, your soul. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So we sing that song, look and live. What is that about? It's about Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Even so must the son of man be lifted up. If you look upon that, ye shall live. So we will overcome in this world by our faith in what God said. Not our adoration of the wafer, Jesus. 1 John five eighteen. We know that whosoever is born of God, here he says it again, is sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. This is where the guardianship and the protectorate of God comes into play. I was talking to somebody this week about guardian angels. I believe in them. Well, they asked the question, if angels are supposed to guard and protect people, how come Christians still get in car wrecks? And how come they, bad things happen to them? They fall, whatever, end up in the hospital, end up in car accident. How come that happens to them? I said, maybe they're not meant to protect the flesh. Maybe they're meant to protect the spirit, the soul of that man. Because if you look at 1 John 5, 18... We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. Satan will not have the power. Now, he does have the power to destroy the body at God's allowance, but he does not have the ability to destroy your soul if God himself is protecting it. He can't touch it. He can't take away your second birthday. By the way, it's my sister's birthday today. She better show up here Sunday and get her present. Okay. Rose, you need to go to the Walgreens and get some Bengay, Icy Hot, some Tylenol. My sister can pick some of those out for her present. All right. Those heat wraps, you know, maybe that might help. All right. Anyway, Ephesians 2.15. Here's what it means to be born again. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. Of twain, what's he talking about? He's talking about himself, Christ, and us. Joining with Christ at his appearing. The death of the body is what produces this. It is the death of Christ. Christ has already died. He's the firstborn of those who die. We're going to die when we do. We will be joined with Jesus instantly on that day 
and of the twain will make one new man. We will literally be the body of Jesus Christ. Amen. Ephesians 2.24 and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. I read today, and, and I'm going to show you some of the crazy superstitions that go along with that Eucharist Jesus thing. Crazy stuff they do. Some of it I've already showed you. But when we put on... And, and part of it is they have a rule that before you go to church and eat the, the Eucharist, the mass, the wafer, you must not have eaten for at least an hour and drank at least an hour before the mass starts. It's one of their rules that you have to fast for at least an hour i guess so that jesus doesn't mix in with your bacon and eggs or if you go to midnight mass your pizza or whatever that's that's the kind of stuff they come up with now the rules that's false holiness and they tell people now don't think bad thoughts don't commit any bad sins don't do anything for a few days going up to the mass that way you are as holy as you can be then you're holy enough to eat that wafer wait a minute i thought that we were made holy by salvation not that we make ourselves holy so that god can accept us for salvation if that's the case then we did it all wrong and if that's the case, it is impossible for anyone to be saved. Because you cannot purify yourself. No amount of genuflecting, holy water, none of that can make you holy before God. The new man, which is created by God in righteousness, is, is true Holiness, because it never sins. Colossians 3.10, you have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. And I'm going to be honest. And I'm going to be a little mean about this. Ignorant Christians. I wonder about ignorant Christians. People who say they're born again, but they couldn't tell you Adam from Moses in the Bible. It's like that buggy driver. Michaela, you remember that buggy driver we rode in the Amish buggy? I was giving that man scriptures and trying to talk Bible with him. He had been Amish all his life. He had no idea anything I was talking about. Didn't know a lick of scripture. Hardly even knew any stories out of the Bible. That man, I'm telling you, was just as lost as anybody else you've ever known. But he had his suspenders on correctly. And he wore his hat the right way. And he had his beard without a mustache. The way he was told to wear it. So in their eyes that made him a good Amish. And he worked hard every day. According to them. He's a member and he's a good member in good standing of their church. And he can be part of the elect. He can be. He can go to heaven. But that's not salvation. That's not true holiness. And it's definitely not. He has not renewed himself in knowledge. 
if you think you've got all the Bible figured out, then I would say don't read it anymore. But if you don't have all the Bible figured out, I would keep reading it. And I'm telling you, John will, John will tell you, God showed me something today. I've been asking him for, for a while now. And it hit me today. And I'm not saying what it is yet because it's, it's a stew that's too new. It hadn't cooked long enough yet. Okay, the best chili in the world is the chili that you put together, you cook it for hours, put it in the fridge, then heat it up, eat it the next day. When all those flavors get mashed in together real good. And right now, this is too new. But I'm telling you, it is phenomenal. Okay? And all I was doing was just reading the Bible. And where I was reading really wasn't part of what I've been asking God about. But he decided to tell me right then. John knows what I'm talking about. You're going to have to. And you can't tell anybody else either. I'll, I'll fire you. Yeah. All right. I, listen, I, I'm telling you. There's more in this book than you ever thought there could be. There is. And the devil has got you people chasing your tails. I said that yesterday. I'm saying it again today. You are chasing your tails if you're reading, still reading stuff on the internet, looking for clues and answers about what's going to happen. You are chasing your tails. I'm telling you. It's here. It's here. It's not out there. It's right here.